The guy's strong like a chimpanzee. Parisian trying to turn up the heat. I just put the heat on him. That's how I want to do. I just want to beat him up bad. And... Carl Parisian is starting to turn the heat up. I'm always going to be here. And when I do this, that means turn up the heat and it's going to get hot in here pretty soon. Carl, the heat A few months ago, the UFC YouTube channel uploaded one of my favorite old fights, George St. Pierre vs. Carl Parisian. If you've already seen this fight, you know that it wasn't necessarily all that great. It was not a violent back and forth war, nor was it an iconic performance from the all time great George St. Pierre. But I like this fight because it's a time capsule of what was, in retrospect, the golden age of MMA. There were a lot of fun artifacts from this fight. Carl, the Heat Parisian, 22 years old. Chris, lights out Lido, 30 years old. Everything else, virtually identical. This era was sort of the threshold of early and modern MMA, which GSP himself was of course in large part responsible for ushering in. But he had not yet done that here. This was the French Canadian's UFC debut. The commentary can seem a bit funny in retrospect, as Mike Goldberg and Joe Rogan seem to have very little familiarity with St. Pierre. St. Pierre is, uh, he comes with a big reputation from Canada. He's, uh... They make no mention of his Kyokushin karate background and seem dismissive of his grappling prowess. It's also interesting how much they are in awe of his size and strength for a welterweight, whereas today GSP would be an average sized welterweight if not smaller. A lot of people make fun of this commentary now, but we have to put ourselves in their shoes. Parisian was a big deal back then. He had a ton of hype behind him, precisely because he was one of the most decorated grapplers in MMA. He even aspired to be a Judo Olympian, and certainly had the potential to do so had he not pursued his MMA career instead, which according to him was out of boredom and because he needed the money. So it made sense for the commentary to be a bit skewed towards him. You look at Caro through this whole thing, he's getting punched. He, he just looks calm. He looks like he's taking a nap. He's totally relaxed. And in spite of this being a unanimous decision victory for George, it was not without some drama, as Caro had multiple serious submission attempts, which St. Pierre managed to escape, seemingly through pure will. GSP of course went on to become one of the legends of the sport, but in spite of accomplishing everything short of a UFC title, Carl was not remembered quite so fondly. He is usually remembered for one of two things, his appearance on The Ultimate Fighter, Have some respect, who are you dude? Do you even know me? Do you know who I am? And his very public struggle with painkiller addiction. There was some speculation, I think one of your training partners even said, you having painkiller problems to the point where you'd become addicted to painkillers. Is that true? What was going on with that, Carl? <laughs> I'd rather have my eye pop out of my head than my name come out. When your name comes out as this guy did this, mm -hmm. it's the worst thing in the world. Okay, I took two pain pills for my torn hamstring legally with a freaking paper, with a prescription. But I argue that Carl Parisian is much more than that. You know you're not on my level, so I'm just gonna bring the heat. Carl Parisian is the quintessential armor bro. We could have just ended the discussion right there, but not everyone appreciates ethnic stereotypes. Karo was born in the Armenian Soviet Socialist Republic in 1982. His family emigrated to the United States when he was 6 years old, where his father put him in judo classes from a very young age. He trained under Gokar Chivichian and Jean Labelle in what they had termed the Hayastan grappling system. Hayastan means Armenia in Armenian, because what else would Karo Parisian's gym be called? If you're not familiar with the Hayastan grappling system, that's because you don't really need to be. It's sort of a marketing buzzword. What Chivichian and Labelle were essentially doing was teaching judo specifically geared towards MMA, which is more rare than you might think. Most of our viewers are in the United States and surely know the names Ronda Rousey and Kayla Harrison, but I would venture to guess that far fewer of you know the name Travis Stevens. Stevens won a silver medal at the 2016 Olympic Games in Brazil. He's a Godan black belt in Judo and got his Jiu-Jitsu black belt from the John Denner. The reason why you probably don't know his name but definitely know Rousey's is simple. Rousey was an MMA, Stevens was not. But believe it or not, while it has been steadily declining in the United States, 
Judo was still insanely popular around the world, not as a hobbyist sport, but as a competitive sport. And its emergence as an international sport happened decades before the emergence of MMA, which gives it a worldwide reach rivaled perhaps only by soccer or wrestling. Couple that with the rigidity and politics and entrenched power of the governing body that regulates Judo, and the result was that no massive efforts were ever made to adapt Judo as a system to MMA. Regardless of his Olympic aspirations, Kara was effectively not training Judo in the strict sense. He was training Judo for MMA. In any case, we can appreciate that it played out like that, because that's how we got this. Gotta hold the arm, there's the flip! That's it! There's the come on! Does he have it? Will he get it? Does he have it? File this under techniques that don't look like they'd ever work, but actually do. Karo gets in position for a standing Kimura, then flips GSP and tries to finish the submission from side control. The mechanics behind this are quite simple. The idea is that your opponent has no choice but to flip. His shoulder joint won't go any further, so his body follows it. And oh look, here's Masahiko Kimura himself demonstrating the very same technique. But Kimura is wearing the heavy cotton jacket known as the Judogi. Kara was doing this half naked and covered in both his and his opponent's sweat. The guy has no gi, he has no shirt. He's uh, he's he's bare and at the same time it's slippery. And was this just a fluke? Nope. It happened again later in this very same fight. And of course, he had already done this against Dave Strasser in his previous fight and got the tap. I don't think we've seen judo like that in the octagon and ever. Uh, actually, this is a judo throw called sumigashi. I flipped him over and I, I had to come around my arm and I just went for the submission. Yeah, this is one of my uh, one of my favorite ones actually. I kid a lot of people in this. Thank God I actually worked in the UFC. And even without getting the tap, he performed this takedown on other occasions as well, which is pretty impressive in its own right. Carl, going for that Kimura. If Caro had nothing else to show of his MMA career other than the fact that he was able to perform this seemingly low percentage technique multiple times effectively, then that's an impressive career in my opinion. But Caro's career was more than that. He was arguably the greatest UFC fighter to never have won a belt. And if you don't think so, take a closer look. Caro's overall professional MMA record is 24 and 12, which doesn't seem all that impressive. But what if we focus only on his UFC career? After beating Strasser in his promotional debut and losing the decision to St. Pierre, he had a quick stint in the WEC where he took the welterweight belt from Shoney Carter in a dominant decision victory. Then he went back to the UFC and won three straight fights, including one against the better Diaz brother. I'm gonna try to beat Nick Diaz in a way that people will say, wow. His dominant victory over Matt Serra earned him a title shot against then-champion Matt Hughes, but this is really where Parisian's career took a turn for the worse. He injured his hamstring while training for the Hughes fight. Hughes ended up fighting Joe Riggs instead. And Carl was never quite the same fighter after that injury, but he was still really good. He would end up going 4-2 with one no contest in his remaining UFC fights before being released and bouncing around smaller promotions. When it was all said and done, he finished his UFC career with 8 wins, 3 losses, and 1 no contest. But the thing is, most of his wins were one-sided, whereas none of his losses were bad. In his fight with St. Pierre, as we mentioned earlier, he nearly submitted the consensus GOAT, twice. What I'm shooting for is pure annihilation on Diego. Against Diego Sanchez, it was a competitive, hard-fought bout, but Diego pulled away in the third round due to superior conditioning. Against Alves, he very clearly won the first round before getting stopped in the second. And that's another thing, Caro may have only been 25 years old at the time of that fight, but he had been fighting since he was 14 years old. Earlier in his career, he probably could have withstood that flurry by Alves and survived to fight on. In fact, that's exactly what he did against Matt Serra. He survived a very precarious situation in the first round and ended up winning the fight in dominant fashion. In fact, two of the judges gave Caro the first round because of all he managed to do in the remainder of the round after nearly getting finished. But by the time he was fighting Alves, even though he was still young, he had taken too much damage, and that was that. So in other words, Parisian's UFC career was spent in the promotion's most storied division. He was facing top competition more or less from day one. He usually won comfortably, and he was always competitive and always dangerous, even in his losses. And the only thing that prevented him from fighting for a title was bad injury luck. It really is a crime that he's among the most forgotten fighters of that era. A lot of his fights are of the type that would just never take place today. 
more like submission grappling matches with an occasional strike or two. But remember, his career was in the threshold of old and new MMA. Everyone was still a specialist at that point, and Caro's style of grappling definitely stood out from the pack. Throwing with a nice judo throw, getting on top, see a little blood, finish with the submission. It wasn't just the judo flair. I mentioned before that he used the sumigaeshi from Kimura Grip, something which you would never think could work in a no-gi MMA setting. But even a lot of his other go-to throws were not the typical judo takedowns you tend to see in modern MMA. No, one of his favorite techniques was this. Uchimata is a hip throw where you turn away from your opponent and momentarily hold his as well as your own entire body weight on one leg and then toss him onto the mat as soon as his feet leave the ground. It's a very dynamic throw and quite visually beautiful as well. When people picture judo, this is likely what comes to mind. It's also stupid. Uchimata is an incredibly risky technique. If the grips or the timing is just a little bit off, it's highly likely that your opponent ends up on top of you, in mount or back mount even. It's even risky in judo, but at least there you could say that the risk is mitigated by the potential reward. One clean throw can win you the match. There's no such potential reward in MMA. The best you can do with an uchimata is the same as the best you can do in any other takedown. That is, you know, take your opponent down. But that didn't stop Karo. He attempted uchimata in just about every one of his UFC fights and actually succeeded seemingly more often than not. And what's more is, I don't recall him ever once being in a compromised position as a result of attempting this suicidal takedown. It's testament to his technical prowess, but he was an intelligent fighter as well, and his positional awareness was truly high level. It was not until well after his prime that someone managed to get a tap out of Parisian. Before that, he was presumed to be unsubmittable. But stuff happens with MMA. So look at it as a learning uh, prospect. Whatever. Thank you. God bless Pringle. He was even able to intelligently understand and analyze his fights shortly after having fought them. Are you surprised that it was a split decision? Uh... He had a good shot in the second round, he's got great hands, so I'll give him a second round, yeah. But more than anything, he was a grappler. He was comfortable in any position in the clinch, because he had a diverse takedown game and could use a wide array of different grips. And on the ground, he almost always had the dominant position, even if he sometimes struggled to finish his opponents. Two. Oh, big right. Nice right hand by Carl. And this demonstrates the versatility of the sport of mixed martial arts. Yeah, absolutely. And he wasn't stubborn like a certain other famous judo person. After Diego Sanchez beat Parisian through superior striking and conditioning, it was evident that Caro acknowledged the holes in his game. This was reflected in his very next fight against Drew Fickett. He showed off some much improved striking and did some excellent work with the jab, particularly in round three. But by then he was already too old. Now you might be thinking, well, what do you mean he was too old? He was only 24 years old when he fought Fickett. But as I said before, Caro started competitive MMA at age 14. A fighter's peak generally lasts 10 years. Not only had Caro's 10 years already passed, but he had sustained a serious injury. He wasn't washed by any means, but his days of chasing the title were certainly over. And this was evident in how he could no longer impose his will in terms of takedowns and ground game, as he once did. Caro's post-UFC career was a mixed bag. He had some wins and some losses, but of course his level of competition was nowhere near what it had been when he was a title contender. Like if you notice here, this fight is being held outside a Walmart. This is also the stage of his career where he started getting tattoos. The cross tattoo he always had on his right bicep is something every Armenian man in Glendale has, and Kara was probably born with it. I'm not referring to that one. But this? This was just a cry for help. Bellator always answers the call of fighters who are crying for help, so they sign Parisian. And he wasn't really that bad in Bellator. It wasn't like it was sad to watch him fight. He could still fight. But his chin was now completely shot. At this point in his career, his losses were all the same. He would get hurt by a flurry of punches and go down. His opponent would pounce on him and land some unanswered ground and pound. The referee would stop the fight and then he would protest to the referee that it was stopped too early. This might be why Mike Beltran leaves no room for doubt here. There are a myriad of fighters who come and go. Even most championship caliber fighters are quickly forgotten after the sun sets on their careers. But Karol Parisian is one of those names that as soon as you hear it, memories come rushing back to you. 
I don't think anyone who witnessed Parisian in his prime can ever forget the joy of watching him throw grown men around as if they were a baseball. It didn't go as planned, but I still won the fight. So thank God, I'm, 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 I'm happy. I'm happy, baby. Can you feel the heat?